Hello. We're live on Instagram and on Facebook over here um, with chapter 20 of my so far unpublished book called Finding Starlight. Let me go back a little bit. So Finding Starlight is the true story of my life as told through the lens of a past life regression session. Uh, I'm reading it one chapter a week until it gets published or discovered or I finish it. So we are officially two thirds of the way through. We are on chapter 20 of 30 chapters and I'm super excited to be sharing it with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining in now. Um, if you're just starting this journey with me, you can find the rest of the prior chapters, chapters one through 19 on my website, brittanybowles.com. I was also uploading them to YouTube, but I'm having technical difficulties with the last couple of weeks. So um, right now you can only find all of the chapters either on my website, brittanybowles.com or on my Facebook newsfeed. So with that being said, we will get right into it. Chapter 20 of my unpublished manuscript, Finding Starlight. Chapter 20, learning to breathe. And that's how I did it. I told her as the cloud returned to its neutral moonlit glow, waiting patiently. I tried to clear away an entire world of hurt around my heart all at once with a fire ritual. It worked pretty well. Pretty well, she asked, lifting one eyebrow in skepticism, implying that I was understating the situation. Well, I didn't realize at the time how involved my guides were, I laughed. I did invite them in, but I thought they were a lot less tangible than what we saw. At least, it, is always, it had always seemed that way to me. What do you mean always seemed that way? She asked. Had you invited your spirit guides into your life in other ways prior to this? Yes, I answered. I'm sure I've mentioned this, I thought, but I told her again anyway. I discovered my spirit guides when I was in high school, during the time that I was getting involved in dream interpretation and in lucid dreaming. I did a meditation to try to meet a spirit guide, and instead I found these seven hooded figures. I tried to get them to show me their faces or anything else about them, but I always just saw seven hooded monk-like figures. I can't even call them people because I can't see under their robes and they seem otherworldly somehow. Anyway, all I've managed to learn about them is that they sort of reach consensus and speak to me through one representative that I call animal. Animal? Katrina repeated. I blushed and said, I used to think that it was animal for years. It's sort of embarrassing. Recently, I saw it spelled differently in my mind. I still don't know who or what they are other than a set of guides that always look after me, help with the rituals like the one that we just saw and give me advice when I meditate or ask for guidance. She said, we have many sets of spirit guides. I'm sure you'll meet even more if you haven't already. It's called a soul cluster or a soul family. And we often bump into and interact with our guides throughout our lives. People can have guides like yours, angels, animal guides, ancestors, so many spirit helpers out there for us. I was nodding along. This was something I had learned through the years and felt to be deeply true in my own life. To Katrina, I said, yes, these were the first ones of many to present themselves to me. Because of that and their mysterious way of communicating, I often think of them as my original guides. They are the ones I call on for things like that fire ritual. Still, even having had a relationship with them for all that time and calling them into the ritual on purpose, I didn't realize how involved they really were. I didn't feel or see anything from my perspective that night, other than just a sense of peace and freedom, I finished. 
from my perspective, she said. It looks, from my perspective, she said, it looks like they offered serious healing that night. I agreed. That must be why it worked so well. After that, I felt a lot better, freer. For the first time I could remember, I felt genuinely happy. Like I actually had a shot at a joyful life. I read The Secret about the Law of Attraction and started experimenting with visualization to manifest what I wanted in my life. I focused on positivity and learned new tools to hold on to that mindset. Katrina was nodding along excitedly as if to say, now we're talking. Life on St. Croix then became incredibly healing. The island was beginning to rub off on me. Somewhere along the way, I started to belong to it. The sunshine, waves, and forest are truly magical. I pictured the lovely turquoise water. I learned yoga in this gorgeous open air studio that overlooked a courtyard. It was lovely, richly painted in shades of pink with banana trees, tortoises, and a stone fountain. Cloud, I interrupted myself to bring the scene to her. Though I didn't know it at the time, that first yoga experience would change my life. I needed her to really see what I saw, and I was excited for the vibrant and otherworldly perspective the cloud would add. It was a picturesque day. The sky was blue, the sun was warm, and the breeze was salty. The studio was an oasis in the brightly colored city of Christiansted. It shone like a beacon on the small street pulsing with energy. I entered through a juice bar, Lalita, and met a tall Englishman named Jonathan. He had the same white aura as the angel aunt from earlier and spoke with the mischievous tone of a nymph. Are you here for yoga? He asked with curious eyes and a smooth melodic voice. The first time I saw that smile, I knew that Jonathan, later, just Jonna, and I would be friends. Yes, I am, I replied, smiling back at him. It's my first time. <sighs> Sorry, emotional. I miss him a lot. The scent of banana blossoms and fresh ginger filled the air. Gesturing to his raw food menu, he said, rather than asked, join me for dinner afterward. Nikki, propping up her yoga mat and leaning on the counter to read the menu, told me that the food looked delicious and that we should definitely try it sometime. My stomach growled. Not today. I need a pork chop. Jonathan tried not to appear overly appalled and said, next time then. Have a good class. We walked up a polished mahogany staircase the second, to the second story loft, which was an amazing open air studio overlooking the koi pond and courtyard below. Large arched windows with solid wooden shutters were wide open, letting the, ble the breeze flow through. Once I was on the mat, I was instructed to sit with my eyes closed and breathe. My anxious mind had me twitching. My lungs screamed and strained in protest. Deep breaths were not my forte, I confided to Katrina while watching my younger, much more fidgety self. We moved our bodies then in ways that were both beautiful and magical. The instructor said, Allow yourself to return to the body if the attention wanders. At the end, we rested. My eyes closed, breath slowed, mind emptied. I was utterly still, completely content. I was home, I explained to Katrina in a dreamy, breathy voice. For the first time in my life, I had experienced true peace, felt quietude and safety, and had a glimpse of the kind of person I could be, the kind of person who was 
steady and at ease. On the surface of the cloud, we said namaste and left the studio. Did you like it? Jonathan asked as I floated down the staircase. Yes, I breathed. I will be back. Yoga, I told Katrina when the image faded, is where I find myself. Still to this day, I get lost and I go to my mat. I relearned how to breathe in that studio. After pneumonia and everything that happened with Blair, I never expected to find pleasure in breathing, but it's everything. The breath is everything. My breath teaches me about myself. And Jonathan, my dear, dear friend. Jonna, for short, took me under his wing and taught me about using food to heal people. We listened to Pink Floyd and reggae records while he explained the benefits of eating raw vegan foods. He always insisted to customers, especially the rude ones, that we don't work under pressure here. He would rather tell people to go eat somewhere else than to compromise his vibe. The first month I lived on island, his son, Fred, came to visit from England. I thought I was in love. Fred and I had a short-lived but passionate summer romance. It ended with him telling me he loved me and then, in the next breath, that he had a serious girlfriend back home. Typical. Jonathan and I got close that week and thereafter we were co-conspirators, food lovers, and pretentious health jerks if we were grumpy. It was one of the best friendships of my life. Here was a man who wanted nothing from me. We enjoyed each other's company. He valued my opinion, had meaningful conversations with me, and lit up at my presence. Jonna was one of the few men in my life who was a true friend without any lingering pressure. We shared secrets and stories. He became my sanctuary. My feet always carried me to Lolita, to Jonna's place, when my heart couldn't find the way. He greeted me like he knew that I was coming, with open arms and encouraging words. I paused, silently remembering. Later, much later, I received the phone call that Jonna had gotten sick and passed on. You honor his memory so beautifully, she said, and I could see in her eyes that she knew him a little because of my story. He was a beautiful man, I said, dashing a tear from my eye. We were all lucky to have him. I let the silence be filled with my love for him for a moment longer before continuing. The one thing I promised myself I would never forget about life on St. Croix was taking the time to watch the sunset. Every day as the sun sets, people stop whatever they're doing just to watch the sun sink into the horizon. It's a ritual all its own. My memories of life on the island were already romanticized, but the images I drew up as we sat talking were things of beauty. Sunset is a point of conversation on island life. It's an event, a moment in every day to absorb the peace and beauty of the world. I have seen the sun set into the rainforest valley. I've seen it sink behind the silhouette of the island from both sailboat and surfboard. I've stood waist high in warm salt water as the sky turned orange and pink and the sun became a glowing ball over the sea. That sounds magical, Katrina said.